is uh, my great pleasure to introduce um, our plenary speaker for this session, Ben Yu. She's going to be telling us about uh, veridical <laughs> data science for uh, biological discovery, detecting epistatic interactions with an epi tree. And uh, Ben is an incredibly accomplished uh, scientist. Uh, I, I can't possibly do her justice in a short amount of time. She's the Chancellor's Distinguished Professor in Class of 1936, uh, second chair at the Department of Statistics and Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at UC Berkeley. She's a Chan Zuckerberg Biohub investigator. She was a, a Wheel NeuroHub investigator. And just a little bit of uh, biography on Ben. She got her uh, bachelor's in mathematics from Peking University and then uh, did her uh, both her master's and PhD in statistics uh, just down the hill from us at UC Berkeley. She's a member of the National Academy. She's a Google Guggenheim Fellow. Uh, she's a Scott Prize winner. Uh, much, much, much more. But I don't want to take uh, too much time from her talk. So um, with this, I'm going to stop sharing and um, turn it over to you, Ben. Thank you so much for uh, giving us this presentation early on a Monday morning. Thank you very much, Trent, for a very kind introduction. Let me get my slides going. Yeah, so um, there we go. Oh, just real quick, if you have questions, please use the Q&A feature uh, within the platform. And I'm gonna, I'll, I'll uh, keep track of the questions for Ben. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Tran. It would be great if you can help me to uh, like relate the questions. Well, thank you very much uh, for inviting me to be here and it's really a great pleasure to share my our work. And I think Tran's talk actually set the stage very well. Even I haven't worked on the, um, the problems like um, exactly, but I think a lot of the statistical machine learning methods are actually transferable. So vertical data science, vertical means truthful. I think it's still a word in use in Spanish, but not so much in English anymore. And the goal is really for reliable, responsible data analysis and decision making. So um, we're kind of in the world of AI, right? We hear everything as AI. And I like this quote from Bill Gates. AI is like nuclear energy, both promising and dangerous. So the goal is really to maximize the promise and mitigate the dangers. And under the hood of any AI device or platform, data science is a key element. There's always a data like component to any of the so-called AI. And we have computer science, mathematics, statistics, and domain not really integrated under the new umbrella of data science. And we need domain knowledge and um, put in the context of decision making. As I said, I think two approaches for trustworthy AI data science. One is what I will advocate, which is share best practices to maximize the promise. The other is risk management to reduce the dangers like intervention. And in a paper with my former student, Kumbir, we define vertical data science as the extraction of reliable reproducible information from data, which you saw a lot of examples in trans talk. And also with emphasis on communication the evidence of empirical data results and also evaluation. So it's really a holistic approach about data science, look at the whole um, pipeline. And I have been living in the world mostly about some biology and a lot of precision medicine problems. And one problem I will come back to and throughout the, the talk is really the Biohub project with a team of people from Stanford, Ashley Slab and James Priest, and actually my colleague at IBL, Van Brown, and uh, people at UCSF, and wonderful postdoc and student, Merbel, Kumbir, my team, and Tiffany, and many others. And Chad, who is a fellow at Stanford. So let's take this um, problem of um, a cardiology, but it could be a particular, say, enhancer for some plant biology you care about. So let's just try to make the connection. So you have a label, say, um, HCM, which is a disease. And in your world, you might be interested in looking at what genes drive a particular enhancer for a particular plant. And which data to use? So that's a medical question. You have a biological question. And what data to use? How do you clean it? How do you look at the data? And which algorithm to use, right? There are tens of possibilities and how to interpret it, how to evaluate it. So every step that way, we're making human judgment calls. 
it's just not available. So that's a recognition that after you do all the wonderful experiments and tune your machines and quality control your machines, the data science part of the platform still need quality control. And the knobs here are actually human judgment calls. Of course, when you tune the machine, you also do human judgment call. But here you even have um, just as many, if no more, human judgment calls. So I like to think our data science um, pipeline as a whole system. Think it as hardware. And you have all these different steps. And you have different parts, different people can take do differently. Do we get the same result? So you have all the cool science and the data, but this part if it's not quality controlled, we still don't have reliable uh, scientific conclusions. So this is really the integrated part for your um, scientific conclusion. So to maximize promises, as I said, we need to, the models, the algorithms, the way interact with data have to capture reality, not just, I can write any algorithm on similar tabular data, but if the algorithm don't have the analytical match, then you won't find the right structures. You're gonna force your data into some imagined structures. And also the human judgment calls, we have to be stable or robust. So two individuals do the same statistical analysis will reach the same, at least quality of conclusions. Otherwise it's very disconcerting. I have about 20 people in my team. I give them the same data, work with you guys separately and they end up with 20 different conclusions. I hope you agree with me, that's very disconcerting. So we need to introduce quality control and standardization for this system. And these systems, you know, this quality control should build down already existing empirical practices. So this is the setting the stage. For the rest of my talk, I'm gonna introduce this PCS, conceptual framework, integrate statistic and machine learning, and expand on both. And I will give you a case study using the ideas of PCS to drive new algorithm development. So PCS can be used for every stage, but still most of the time we're using it for the data analysis stage. And we do iterative random forest with Ben Brown. And also we're moving towards a PCS p-value, which testing a more robust non-hypothesis than the very precise one if you look at classical statistics. So my journey into machine learning started with uh, interacting with Leo Bryman, who wrote the paper 20 years ago, who was my late colleague uh, down the hill for you, and contrasting machine learning with statistics. And now they're both merging. So what we developed, me and my collaborators, is really merging the two framework and take predictability and computability with the center of machine learning and add stability, which is expansion of statistical inference to the whole data science life cycle, and we create one culture. So basically, PCI has tried to bridge in a much more extensive way than cross-validation, the two cultures, and make machine learning part of modern statistics and develop both further. So the paper came out with uh, Kankumbir PNS, and it really intends to streamline, unify, and expand on ideas from both machine learning and statistics. So this is a nice drawing from my um, current post uh, Rebecca Butter, and seeing that you know this is really integrated together in this framework. I started ability principle about ten years ago in a paper uh, for the Bernoulli lecture, uh, Tukey lecture. Of Bernoulli society, it's really a common sense. At the time, there was a lot of uh, coverage of not false positive uh, discoveries in the media, in biology. And I integrated the idea of data perturbation with model perturbation into the end of the same framework and called for a new principle called stability principle. And you can also go philosophical and find some writings of Plato thousands of years ago about the importance of stability for any knowledge. So this is, I hope it's very common sense. And PCS really connects both science and engineering. And so data science for me is both science field and also engineering field. And predictability and stability, especially, I think should be familiar to the audience, really embed two scientific principles, prediction and also replication. Right, replication not in terms of the labs and the tubes, but 
the way I look at it, it's also like some hardware. You have different parts, you put it in, you want the different parts, but different people really reach the same conclusion. So it's more about human judgment calls than, um, well, you still have human judgment call in the wild lab as well. And computability, we expand on the machine learning computability from scalability and you know fast algorithm convergence to also include a data inspired simulation part. So my group is writing a paper on expanding that to set some principles for data inspired simulations. So that as another kind of um, dry lab to tune the different and test different methods. PCS in a nutshell is really holding predictability as a um, default reality check, but you can also add other reality. It was never intended that you only do prediction. You should add other reality check, say comparing with domain knowledge, multiple loss functions in your prediction, and different ways you split the data for prediction. So there are many, many different ways you do reliability check. And stability analysis is really over human judgment causing every step of the way of the life science, um, data science life cycle. And computability is a necessity when you do prediction, but I said many different loss functions, different ways split data, you have to compute. So it's also a um, scalability question we start to address uh, in under computability. And I like you to think stability is really how you have this hardware, like this round, you know, parts. When you shake it, you don't want this data science life cycle to break. And the perturbations need to be recorded as reasonable perturbations, right? For example, my cell phone, suppose the device is my cell phone. You would like the cell phone to drop and not to break, but not really through really, really hard on a very, very hard war, right? So you want the reasonable perturbations, which could have happened in the process naturally, unless you want to do stress tests. You think you want, you know, this cell phone to be ex extremely, extremely um, sturdy because somehow this person had to take it to some very dangerous situations, right? So, so this is a human judgment call again, and you record it. And the metric is user defined, use domain knowledge, and I really advocate to use multiple metric to measure stability. And in our work, we use, I would say, um, context appropriate different metrics. And the conceptual framework is really broad and flexible. We start to build some software um, platform. But I mean, the earlier talk really make me think I need to talk to Trent and Ben more about whether some of the ideas will be useful for that uh, data analysis platform you guys building at the G, uh, GGI. And so we can still cannot get away from human judgment calls, right? There's no way you can go through accidents. That's just real life. But what we can do is really make ourselves very clear on what judgment calls we make. So you have reality, genomics, and you have models. And models are really mental construct. They don't really have to bear reality at all unless you make the bridge through the documentation, right? This is Golden Gate Bridge. We actually don't see the bridge. So by putting the picture there, you shouldn't be convinced that there is a bridge. So it's the job of the statistician, and machine learner, or data analyst to really make a narrative of quantitative and qualitative encoding, re reproduce with code to put it together, and then they are related. Otherwise, they just separate things. One exists in your brain, the other is in the reality. And record your judgment calls. You took this method, why? Oh, that's the only one you know, that's fair. Put it down. So, so the user can really see whether to trust your conclusion. Otherwise, this part of your enterprise won't be on solid foundation. And then you have the, the best data you could possibly get. So we also have been using this PCS to stress test a medical decision rule. Here's my collaborator. When I asked him why you like PCS, he actually sought me out um, after hearing a talk two or three years ago. So I uh, was not you know, really one of my friends at the time. So for him, it's really PCS is really looking under the hood to make sure that the conclusion found are the, what the data generally suggests, right? It's a holistic approach. And for you, it would be how biologists understand, interpret, and build the science you need to do, you know, science. For him, it's patience. 
So we stress tested an existing decision route to send P to CT at the ER for abdominal pain. And we kind of proved that the, the decision route they use actually is very good. So that's called stress testing. You reanalyze some um, decision path using uh, these principles. So let me just expand on this um, under the hood, right? Data pre-processing, anybody who works with data know it usually takes 60, 80% of the work, human work, because there's no button to press. It's the, the ones curate the data better, you have better conclusions. And this is example from economy, but relevant to all of us. About 10 years ago, two Harvard economists wrote a paper in American Economic Review called Growth and Time of Debt. They had a conclusion look at country data of public debt to GDP ratio. They see that it's bad for hot growth. So they take country and year as the basic unit and they look at the debt and GDP ratio and they see that the growth rate is low for the very high end of debt activity. A few years later, three uh, economists from University of Massachusetts Amherst reanalyze their data and find that some for three reasons they left three data points from New Zealand out and some coding errors and some unconventional weighting when corrected, their conclusion failed. But the problem is that this paper was highly cited to support austerity policy in UK and Europe. Right? I mean, now, 10 years later, the economy seemed to be a lot more relaxed about austerity policies with all the stimulation package. But at the time, many countries didn't want to do stimulation. So this is a high impact paper and you know, three data points made a difference. So I'm sure um, you ask different people in your life to redo the data curation. In your world, you probably not get exactly the same result. But hopefully the downstream qualitative conclusion was still saying like which gene is important. If it's not, I think we should redo the analysis and have a discussion before we say you find a gene that's driving some uh, phenotype. So right now we're working with the HCM, the SLAB, and we suggest the ex actually gene gene interaction, interaction they did a knockout experiment. And then we're analyzing the results. So we predicted or conjectured that we change the cell size because HCM is about a uh, heart function and the cell size is believed to be um, a factor in for the heart malfunctioning. You have too big um, uh, heart cells. And the data on the right was the first product, um, provided for us because high throughput and you have to find the cells and measure the sizes. And we felt like some of the cells actually clumps of cells. So we asked them to do some high resolution images it's on the left. So we we'll prefer to use only high resolution data, but then it's not high throughput. But if we go with high resolution, we reach the same conclusion as we use the re low resolution, which is plenty. So we have to try to you know, use both and maybe borrow strands from some limited high resolution images, right? So, but you, you're probably not gonna reach the same conclusion. It's much harder to see the clump cells and you might call that the big cell. So you might have a very different conclusion. So that's where we are uh, doing for this um, BioHub project. And often in machine learning world, or cross validation or proper testing, we do data split. And random split is not always the best idea. I think as biology, you guys know, you probably want the different tunings of the machine set aside for transfer learning as the proper uh, test set instead of random scramble out all the data because more likely in the future, your method will be used under different tuning, probably prepared by different people for the sample. And in the medical situation, we should probably do time split for future patient in a clinical trial, right? This is another paper using PCI to find subgroups for a particular um, beneficial group of painkiller, which actually not used anymore called the VOX. But the goal is you want to set up your test set as close as possible as the future data. So random slip, split is often very questionable because you create two data sets too similar and doesn't really reflect your future data because your future data is not a random split of current data. So that's something, again, human judgment cost, the context, how the data is um, collected and the future. So always keep future uh, in mind. 
And algorithm choices. Now with the software, you know, when I was a graduate student, you just barely program up one particular approach, say for supervised learning. But now with the software development, a lot of the energy, human energy should be really thinking about this, uh, make the process controlled instead of uh, try to write up another new package. Uh, in terms of methods, right? I think ABL also work a lot on climate models. And we have at least nine climate models, which is commonly cited for global temperature rise at the end of this century. The degree um, varies from 1.5 degrees to 5.5. And this will be all good to report. And this is all based on very good human judgment calls, but probably different data, different boundary condition, different resolution result in this um, nine models. So it's healthy and recommended that for the different uh, results and their different modeling approaches. And back to epistasis, right? So this is started by Fisher, a nonlinear relation between two or more genetic variants and specific phenotype, right? He just went for logistic and with additive and polynomial. But why polynomial is one nonlinear? We think, my team think that decision tree is a better form of interaction because decision tree captures a thresholding behavior. Now we know in biology, Fisher probably didn't know at the time that um, often the biomolecules interact in a thresholding fashion. They have to reach certain abundance before they interact. Or you can have the smooth version of it. Use our RIF, which I'll uh, discover, um, discuss and then have a smooth version of that. And what's the scale? There's a mathematical theorem that everything can be looked at as additive if you have the right scale. So do the logic scale as Fisher did or do the penetration, what do we decide to do? Just take the probability uh, of a phenotype giving two genes as the scale instead of taking the logic transform. So all these judgment calls end up with many choices. Then I hope I convinced you there's so many human judgment calls and lead to perturbation in the data science life cycle. But how do you choose? So practically, you cannot try all perturbations because you'll never finish. However, it's also more like put your head in the sand if you just pick one and only do one, right? So a company of mine is do a couple, at least, at least two. So for each step of decision, uh, data science life cycle. There are multiple choices as I had uh, demonstrated. And you could also solicit different weights. Say you have two different ways to process the RNA-seq data for normalization. At least you should keep two clean data versions. That's I think I would like to recommend. I mean, to be honest, my group hasn't done that either, but moving forward, we should do that. Keep two clean versions and then run the downstream steps with two different versions. Do you reach different conclusions? Two is not too many. And for different models, as I said, you first use prediction to screen out certain methods. And maybe for both versions. And for the ones that pass certain threshold, and then you should use that as one of the choices and then run the downstream. So this will give exponential explosion of possibilities, a path in that analysis. But you have human computing constraints. So the recommendation is that you choose by a step. I mean, for the prediction that you do have the screen, you don't want to choose a bad one. And then maybe you, you run five or 10, depends on the resources. Alternative analysis pathways. And then you collect the perturbation result as the climate model, they had nine. And then you want the quality of conclusions about which genes are important before you do now experiments to be consistent for this kind of arbitrary pathways you took in the data analysis pipeline. So that's, I think, safer and which will yield better uh, results, more trustworthy results, or better um, false dis um, lower false discovery rate. So it's kind of a compromise that you cannot run everything, but you should have to do more than one. So at least you should do two alternative pathways. So this is kind of a high level uh, description of PCS. 
Now for the second part of the talk, I want to talk about a work we use PCI at the modeling stage. Full disclosure, even I talk about the full pipeline, we still mostly at the modeling stage, right? Not taking into account the, the data cleaning as a pipeline. So I hope that's a uh, future can do it together. But right now I'm going to the modeling stage that have this work drawn with Ben Brown from IBL and also my department, our postdoc and students um, to um, pursue and compare to add stability to random forest. So, so this is a problem a lot harder than computer vision. Computer vision, you know a cat, you find a cat. But as you all know, genomic discovery, you don't know that was the right pattern to look for. So there's a search expense, quite significant, than knowing what you're looking for just fine. And it's also well known for yourself and other biologists that there are more than second order interactions. And that's a problem for the Fisher approach. When you take all the polynomial false order, you have explosion of terms and then quickly round up the data to really uh, compare the different patterns. So there's a false order interaction for, for Drosophila. And as I mentioned earlier, there's this French flag model, this um, phenomenon thresholding also occurring in other biological phenomena, hope also in plants, that you need thresholding, certain abundance of different biomolecule amount before things happen. So decision tree is a good match, a mathematical simplification of that threshold behavior. Of course, it's not perfect. How do you decide on the thresholds? But this phenomenon thresholding, I think, is much better captured by random forest. It remains to be seen whether deep learning. We try to combine with deep learning, but we are not there yet for the search, whether that will give similar results, or we can have to use the search from deep learning and then go back to decision trees. We have quite good success from uh, decision trees. And random forest, I hope many of you know, is really um, you randomly select the features you have, you have 1,000 genes and you try to predict enhancer status or transcription factors, 1,000, and you randomly select uniformly and you build decision trees through a greedy fashion to find the break ones to make the nodes as pure as possible. And then you can do the bootstrap and work on the subsample. So there's a lot of randomness, random points, and that has predicting bias has been really good results. However, there was a problem. People have already turned before us if two genes or transcription factor land on the same path of a decision tree, they think they interact. That's a, a leap of faith from mathematical structure to biological. But that's something most people seem to agree. That's a good idea. But this can co-occurrence on the same path have found before us being very unstable for interpretation, right? As I try to, stability is extremely important for anything knowledge. You don't want something to be transit and you, you explain, you try to interpret. You need relative stability. So what we did in the RF paper or iterative random forest paper is really add stability. Very much random forest already good prediction. So want to keep that as I show you, we don't lose that. That's sometimes you do lose, but sometimes you actually get better with adding stability. So it can both go either way. We thought we're gonna do stability, but in fact, for this particular enhancer, software enhancer prediction problem, it didn't. So we add stability through self-dimensionality deduction. So each genes for the enhancer prediction problem will have importance index coming out from random forest. That you can change and use your own importance index. And then we're going to up sample the ones more important and down sample those who are not important. So instead of a uniform sampling in random forest. So this way you basically had a reduced in a soft way dimensionality to the important ones. And then we use random intersection trees from Shar and Mannhausen, so this is colleagues from Europe, to find with a quick way to find intersection paths. Then we look for stability. So we reduce dimensionality, and then we have an after loop of um, begging assess stability. And we keep the same memory computation cost as random forest. So the idea is adding stability because we know from previous work, good prediction, but not stable to interpret. So here's a quick result for the enhancer prediction problem with about 80 uh, predictors, transcription factor, you can see the name. So on the left, you see that the ROC curve on a test set and the curves basically on top of each other. They are the different iterations using random part. The first one is uniform. The second one is using weighted and the third one built on the second one. So we don't lose predictive accuracy. On the right, you see a stability plot. So the vertical um, 
labeling is the names of genes. The red ones are Drosophila genes, pairwise interactions. We also find three-way interactions. So these are new discoveries. Uh, among the 20, and we cut at 0.5 for stability from the outer loop of um, E3 random forest. So the outcome of E3 random forest, a list of genes, as you see on the vertical um, of the right plot, give you, you know, which and which we suggest they interact. And then you all ha also have scores like stability. We later added uh, prevalence and precision in a follow-up work called the sign interaction. Among the 20 we found pairwise, we found in the Drosophila literature, and working with uh, Sue Seneca, it's also very much um, IBL lab. We work with her uh, very closely on other projects as well. 80% of the um, pairwise genes already validated in the literature by physical biological pair in the literature. So this is before us use not high throughput data. So this is a good success. Of course, we might miss something, but science is always finding interesting things, not finding everything. So this is good result. And the blue, uh, three way interaction would become a scientific recommendation system. So, back to the um, um, Bioha project for cardiovascular health. We find a surrogate for HCM because use UK buyback data, left ventricle mass, we did standardize it. And we use E2 random forest, uh, actually, a generalized version of it. We have to do more work, but the Backbone is still into random forest. We find four pairs of predictive stable gene pairs. And um, the Stanford group, Ashley's lab, already carried out a CRA transfection experiments and with very promising results. As I show you, we're looking at the cell sizes and we're redoing the analysis and hope to improve and to confirm. So the preliminary analysis based on the software they had, we already see a difference. When you now cut these genes, uh, you see a change in population of cell sizes. So that's an experimental proof. And I want to thank Cheng Wei and uh, Nathan and Tiffany who really, um, and Chad, uh, the, the lead. And also somebody who got the um, Western from Stanford, who got the, put out the phenotype from IMRI uh, uh, images. So the last part, I delve into is in the title, is really how to come up with a PCSP value. So my view of statistical inference is really provide one source of evidence as the whole pipeline of knockout experiments and tuning the machines. So it's really an integral part, not stand alone and can make the decision. So we want to provide our data evidence in the most robust and transparent manner so the domain scientists can understand as much possible the data evidence generation and so you can integrate with your biological knowledge to evaluate the evidence strength and decide what experiments. So that's what we do. When we did, we look into all the databases. So I shall say that we didn't just go directly from the discoveries from RF to lab. We took a lot of time with them and our cell look at the annotated databases and before we decide to go for four pairs. And I just think P value alone is not enough. So we have to really um, take it as one form of evidence, not only one. So the PCS inference idea, it's really um, uses prediction as model checking. We should not do p-values of any sort if we, we don't have any evidence to model capture reality, some reality of the data, right? That's a lot of judgment called what's good enough uh, prediction for model checking. Because p-value is imagining a probabilistic positive you know, framework and usually a more constraint than machine learning methods with cross-validation or test prediction error. So you want some evidence at high level to know that the model actually fits the data before you develop into the detail level of more precise modeling and p-value. So we want to expand the robustness of any statistical testing so we do a lot more perturbation than just more precise like under linear model you know, Gaussian linear model and asymptotic distributions. And it doesn't rely on probabilistic generation model um, assumption. So it's, that's why we call PCS p-value. It's a perturbation based. If you want to go to the confidence level by, you have to do a lot more work to justify your generative models. 
before you can go to the probabilistic interpretation and call confidence. So I think we need to differentiate. Is perturbation based still useful stability and the more precise probabilistic model um, assumption for the traditional p-value. So this is uh, the work which uh, ICAI were actually revising the way we are doing the null hypothesis. We're not done yet. So I'm going to present the version on the um, internet. So Merle uh, Burr, who is now back to Germany, postdoc and come here uh, with the two uh, statistical lead on my side. So the epitree pipeline, oh, sorry, there's a missed I there. So epitree, it's use iter random forest to select gene interactions. You have to down some because you have even 80 predictors or genes. The possibility is even three order, it's 80 to the power of three, right? You, you quickly run out of uh, computing power. So we use iter random forest use data to trim down to uh, for this, we use red hair data. We haven't done it for the um, HCM yet. To about 18 interactions. And then we develop a new PCS epitree test to find epistasis among the select interactions. So the first step, actually this is before the results are presented um, about the HCM, we first decided to test our pipeline, use a red hair phenotype, UK Biobank, because it's well-known pretty genetic and has more data. It's not a rare variant as HCM, it's a one in 500. So we just split the data into a test, 2,000 cases and 2,000 control, make them balanced, and training data about 13,000 is self-reporting uh, red hair. And then we have the SNP data. And we first use, um, uh, predict scan using GTAC data to go to the gene level and we use each random forest, to trim it down to the genes and we, then we can remain on the gene level and look at the epistasis at the gene level. Or we use the selected genes to go back to the SNPs and that's the pre-selection. And then we look at the selected SNPs interaction. So we can do the gene interaction the epistasis uh, discovery or epitry at both the gene level and the uh, SNP level. So the first stage at the gene level is through a predict scan to move to the biologically inspired um, dimensional reduction use GTAC data for the skin uh, tissue. Then we find 18 order two or higher order interactions. Okay, so this is uh, actually we use uh, a more sign version called sign RF, a little more complex, but very much similar. And for this case, each random forest actually adding stability, not just give you interoperability. Now we have 18 collection of genes. It also improved the predicted accuracy. So that means each like random forest doesn't have enough regularization. So the stability added the soft dimensionality reduction served as the needed, the missing uh, regularity. And that's why the green, you actually quite increased to um, for the highest level is for the RF at the SNP level, AUC 95.95 and gene quite close. And you can see Ranger. Ranger is um, it's a version of random forest only at 88. And Lasso actually works not badly, but still the stability beat both and become um, biologically more meaningful too on top of Lasso. And we look at annotated databases and you know, can we qualitatively think that they're reasonable, right? They find um, determinants of hair and pigmentation and also the proteins, the transcription factors, you know, CRISPR proteins seem to know to interact with each other. So this is qualitative validation. And now we want to give a more quantitative evidence um, for each found interaction. So this is two-way interaction, we also have three ways. We went back to the uh, Fisher multiplicative, I had our own way. So what we did is we went for the second decision tree based. We took also the scale as the penetration, just look at the probability you have seen the red hair phenotype giving two genes found through the first um, screening through RF. And we can show that this is a particular um, gene-gene interaction and 
On the right, it's a smooth proportion plot. This is the, you just smooth it out, saying that, you know, for people with this level of this gene and that level of the other gene, and we smooth it out, that's roughly the proportion red hair. And because this is gene level through the discrete data, you see the stripes in data. Even you use linear method to do predict scan, you still, the discreteness uh, shines through. So that's why you see the stripy data like. And we can show that actually response surface uh, for the lower two blocks capture the stripiness and then linear, of course, makes everything switch. So, so for this data, actually, uh, CART is able to go back to a bit to the discreteness, which is the original data, the SNP, and fit the data better. So the CART models, the non-hypothesis is just you fit CART separately and make them additive. And for the new version, which is not updated yet, we also take a singleton with only one or the other. So the new formulation is now no epicis model is a composite hypothesis with the additive and also a singleton and singleton. And we call it, um, graph interaction. And for epicis model for um, second degree, it just you fit them together, you can see there's interaction. First you split on def eight and then you split on SIP, right? So there's interaction. And for three interaction gets a little more complicated. It's more think about there's a pathways we call a graph interaction. So um, please watch out for our new updated version. So this is the version on the internet. We formulate this way. But the qualitative conclusion for red hair doesn't change very much. So um, uh, let me just go saying that we found a novel high order interactions and this is also super heat might be useful for data analysts you can look at you can come up features based on these found interactions and you plot it look at the red hair others you can see the red hair has different patterns so people have red hair because different gene interactions and super heat it's our package it's very useful for that we might give you that so we'll also find some new hair genes which you know uh, evidence not super strong but suggestive and Epi tree logistic versus logistic multiplicative interaction. I think fits data better for the SNP data, even through the gene um, um, imputation. And the epistasis model versus non epistasis model actually are better separated. And the PC, PCSP values, I should say something, we basically make a bigger, more robust non hypothesis through data perturbation so that our conclusion are more robust to deviations from a more precise hypothesis in classical statistics. And the pairwise genes found a very similar using both multiplicative IP tree, but the higher order interactions cannot be done by uh, multiplicative. And the three way interactions, um, we think they are suggested, but no evaluation yet. So to summarize, um, we have this PCS framework, workflow and documentation. And my group has done PCS case studies for eight different projects, precision medicine, biology, and neuroscience, and methodology. Hope you find them useful. I also stress tested um, this in a um, precision medicine problem. And PCS really generate testable hypothesis. So I think it's pretty good fit for this group. You want data now to, to um, kind of screen down your experimental possibilities and so that your experiment will be more efficient. And the PCS principles put into uh, textbook and finishing with um, butter and we'll have an interactive copy on the internet hopefully by end of the year and I uh, hope some of the people want to get more deep into statistics will find it's useful. It's written very much for people not only from statistics and machine learning but other people. And just a shout out for our new division down the hill called Computing Data Science and Society Statistics Department just move in. And our dean is uh, provost, uh, Jennifer Chase. And all these great data science courses, I did Data 100 now, there's also one or two. So here's a list of papers, and I hope we can start some interaction um, with um, JGI and a lot of software packages out there for interpretation and we're building a package in Learn, so make the stability analysis uh, more streamlined. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Ben. That was a great, great talk. I really okay. enjoyed it. Um, I, we have a number of questions. Um, we'll do our best to get through a few right now and then maybe you can answer them uh, on, on just through the chat. Uh, sure. 
Okay, so the first one is from Tai Sok, who asks how this might be useful for uh, COVID data on uh, COVID cases and vaccines. Well, it depends on what, I mean, we did some work uh, for predict uh, death count at the county level, and we have a paper on how we distribute PPE. There, we basically developed multiple prediction um, methods, and then we combine them through weighting. So stability is not just choosing the best, you can also do weighted combination when you, when you have different approaches. So the two predictions we use actually, one is like a linear regime when the growth, one is exponential. And the weight also tell, tell you that which regime, right? in the beginning with exponential explosion, right, in March, but May was more linear. So which predictor that's better actually tell you which regime we're in. And um, so that's kind of just multiple approaches, I think, um, it's diversity and you combine. And with short term, was really, we, we basically came out with a model in 18 days and they use it to ship PPEs based on nonprofit organization. We're very proud of ourselves. I got 10, 12 of my students and postdoc engaged for two months. Wow. And so it's really easy to parallel to, right? Because multiple teams can work on different approaches. Awesome, and man. so my email is being at berkeley.edu. So you can also follow up. I'd love to hear uh, feedback and reactions to this work. Fantastic. I think we can go maybe one minute over. So let me ask you another question. Uh, yes. Adam asks, um, human, you, as you say, human judgment calls impacts every aspect of data science life cycles. How can we increase data science fluency across life sciences community so that we can make more informed judgment calls? Um, so say that again, I'm sorry. I was reading. How can we improve data fluency? You, you talked about the importance of these human uh, judgment calls in basically annotating the data sets, um, and that requires data fluency. And, and how can we improve that? Is there a way to teach it uh, in, yeah. in college? or? Yeah. So my book actually has a whole big chapter on it. Oh, you do? Oh, cool. Yeah. So so I, I'm not ready to send, but I can send it after trying to oh, a few people who won't follow it because uh, so that's the thing. So I, my book, not just PCS, it's really holistic from problem formulation, really try to help quantitative critical thinking. And then we have a whole big chapter, as I really credit my co-author, uh, Rebecca, who did a lot of um, creation and me, um, to have that chapter. Just the things you should think about, right? The common things, right? You cannot cover everything, but we try to list the common problems you want to look for. Awesome. Okay, we better leave it there. Thank you again, Ben, for an amazing talk. And I look forward to collaborating with you. I'm inspired uh, from what you've, you've taught me about. The yeah, thank you want to follow up with the platform you guys built. It seemed perfect. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, well, thank you very much. And thanks, everybody.